cool. Is the audio coming out fine? No audio. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So this is just a short overview of writing shell scripts in Clojure, or to be more specific, Clojure script. Um, I had some data manipulation from JSON files and endpoints that I was doing, and it was getting really hairy doing it with um, a combination of JQ and JavaScript and um, some shell tools. And I thought, well, Clojure has a lot of great uh, you know, standard library functions for manipulating data. So let me try using Clojure or Clojure script to write my shell scripts. And then I started looking into this, and I'll just share what I've learned and some of the useful functionalities that I found for doing that. So this is writing shell scripts in Clojure script using Plank. Uh, what is Plank? Plank is another REPL, um, similar to your lining in REPL or your boot REPL. Plank is this, um, it's a Clojure script specific REPL. I think it runs on top of the JavaScript core engine and it's available for at least Mac OS and Linux. I'm not sure if you can get it on Windows. Um, they don't say that, so maybe not. Um, but it's very lightweight and for shell scripts, the thing that is really important is it starts really fast. So, well, let's do a comparison. If you start your line REPL versus your blank REPL. So line REPL, still taking time, blank is ready, right? So that's the main difference for me. In shell scripts, you don't want to wait for the REPL to start and to stop. Uh, you just want it to completely uh, execute very quickly, and Plank gives you that ability. So, being a Clojure script REPL, Clojure script traditionally lacks a lot of the tools for interacting with files and the shell and things like that because it's targeted more at the browsers as the first um, first sort of target platform. But Plank includes a lot of these things, so I'll walk through what all those functions are in Plank and how they can be used. So the first one is um, invoking external shell tools. So if you're writing a shell script and you want to ex uh, you know, invoke some shell tool that already exists, you can do that in Plank using the sh function. Uh, it's built into the Plank shell namespace. So it's just straightforward, just the name of the command and the arguments. And what it gives you back is this triple of the exit status of the command, um, the standard output, what I was printed there, and whatever went to standard error. Um, one thing that keeps tripping me up when I don't use this for a while is, remember to separate the command and all the arguments as separate strings. If you send it off as one string, it's going to give you an error that makes no sense and it's really hard to debug. It says launch path not accessible. That I spent like a lot of time breaking my head over that error and Googling it and stack overflowing it. And then I realized that I just have to separate the command and the arguments. And just like any other closure thing, once you've um, executed this, you can manipulate it however you like. You can print it out or you know anything else. Cool. The second thing that's quite useful for shell scripts is um, getting all the command line arguments that are passed into the shell script. In Plank, they go into this global variable called command line args. So I have this script here called args.cljs, and all it does is it prints out the command line args. So if I just execute that with these are some arguments, it's just going to print that right back out. Cool, so far, any questions? <coughs> the next one is um, writing and reading files. So in ClojureScript, uh, slurp and spit that exist in Clojure are not present by default, but Plank includes these in the Plank core namespace. So they work pretty much exactly how they work in, sorry, let me just start this again. So they work pretty much exactly how they work in your regular Clojure stuff. Um, once you've required it, you can just use slurp. So I have this file, let me show it to you. It's just some lyrics from a song. 
So when you slurp that, you get that as a string. And similarly, if you take some data, you want to put it in a file, you can spit that back out with Plank. And now you can see there is a math.text in here with the result. So pretty regular stuff. One nice feature that I like with Slurp is um, you can give it a URI. Uh, so if it's like maybe some JSON data or an endpoint or an API that you're accessing, you don't have to shell out to curl every time. If it's a GET request, you can just Slurp it. So this, for instance, will go to that URI, give back whatever response it is. In this case, it's a JSON response. We can go to that website and see. Uh, one sec. Yeah, so it's just a regular JSON response. And Plank will just kind of download that remote endpoint for you and give you the result in a string, a JSON string. Um, the next one is getting data from standard input. So usually when I write the shell scripts, I try to make them as independent from the data they're reading as possible. So I try to like pipe the data in rather than read from a specific file or something like that. So in Plank, you can do that by uh, requiring the in uh, special variable and the slurp method. So you can essentially slurp the in stream and that way you can read whatever standard input has. So for example, we have this file, standard stdin.cljs. So I require slurp and in. And just in this case, it's like an echo. So it just prints it back out. So if you do something like um, echo hello, and you send it off to plank stdin.cljs, so it's just going to print that back out. <laughs> Then the nice feature is, since it's a closure script-based REPL, um, your JSON parsing and JSON serializing functions are already available. You don't need any external libraries for that. You can, so as an example, what we'll do is, uh, again, forgot to start Plank. So require this. So now I'm setting data to be this data from the remote endpoint. So it's just a string of JSON text. And then this is the JS interop syntax in, in ClojureScript. So from the JSON global variable, call the parse method. Oops, sorry. From the JSON global variable, call the parse method on the data um, variable. And it'll give you this. Um, parsed version of that JSON string. But uh, if you notice here, you see this map here is actually tagged with this hash JS syntax. This is actually still a JS map and a JS array. It's not a closure map or a closure array or a closure vector. So when you pass using the JSON parse, you're still getting that uh, native sort of JS-based map and array structure, which is not very nice for us because we want to be able to manipulate that using closures um, functions. And we want you know, to be able to use all the immutable data structures. So the way you do that is this, this is a closure script feature, not a Plank feature. There are these global methods, um, JS to CLJ. And there's another one, CLJ to JS. So what this does is take that native um, JS object and map, or basically an entire structure of that. It can be as deeply nested as, as, as it is. And if you pass it to that, it'll then convert it into the closure equivalent. So now it's a closure data structure. And you can see there's no hash JS and stuff anymore. One thing that we have lost is um, the previously when we passed it, the, the keys in the map were keywords. Now they've changed into strings. Um, the keywords are still pretty useful because keywords in, J in, in Clojure are functions, and you can use them to access the maps. So if you want to keep them as keywords, just remember to pass in the extra option, keywordize keys as true. And then you'll get the same, basically, your Clojure version of the JS maps and uh, objects. Cool so far? 
All right. So the second part of JSON, so that was the parsing part. This is the serialization or the stringifying part. So CLJ to JS will take a closure map, convert it to a JS map. It basically just looks like the same thing with hash JS in front of it. You can manually construct these literals by hand if you want. You could do hash JS, one, two, three, four, and I've got that JS literal. But most of the time, uh, it's preferable to just work with the closure data structures and then at the end, convert them back out to JS. So similar to before, instead of dot parse, this time we call dot stringify. And it takes the closure map, converts it to a JS map, and then string serializes it using JS, uh, using the JSON stringify method. If you do it directly without the CLJ to JS transformation, then you get a whole bunch of crap. And most of the time, I think we don't want that. So remember, if, if you're seeing that whole bunch of crap, it's probably because that CLJ to JS has been forgotten. Um, one thing that people don't generally recommend, but I find is okay to do in shell scripts, is you can do a shorthand version of the parse and stringify. So instead of doing dot parse js slash json, you can directly use json.parse and json.stringify. The reason it's not recommended is if you or some other library overwrites the json global, then it's not gonna, it's not gonna inform you that something's gone wrong, whereas the other method does. But mostly my shell scripts have been, at least the ones I've been writing, have been pretty small, and I know the dependencies they have. So that sort of succinctness is just is worth it in this case. But yeah, it, it works basically the same way. So it'll give you the same results. Cool. Um, one thing I found myself making quite heavy use of is the threading macros in Clojure. I find basically when you're writing shell scripts and you know piping your data through various tools, the threading macro kind of emulates that. So you take a bunch of data, in this case a URL, pipe it through slurp, and then pass it with JSON parse, and then um, uh, pass it to JS, to CLJ, keywordizing the keys. So it inverts that nested function call and kind of flattens it out. And for when you have a long bunch of transformation functions, it makes it very easy to see all the steps in the transformations. You can see, okay, now I'm getting the key, now I'm you know, reducing it to some other value, now I'm manipulating it some way. So instead of this nested, it's, so this and this are basically the same, but it's, I find when it gets very nested, it's much easier to read the threading macro version. Oh, let me, yeah, so this one, and this one will give the same result. Has anyone used the threading macro before? Yeah? So if you're not familiar with it, what it does is whatever you t put as the first argument, this one, it's going to then take that result and pass it as the first argument to the next function. It's going to manipulate that with that function and then pass it as the first argument to the next function. And this is where I also find the json.parse is a bit nicer. Because if you're using dot parse js slash json, then the threading macro will actually try to hang on. Yeah, the threading macro will actually try to place it somewhere here, and that's gonna mess up the flow. You have to wrap it in a in an anonymous function or use the other threading macro, the thread last instead of thread first. Cool, so that kind of wraps it up. I have an example script that I can show you. So I'll walk through what this does. So basically, I just kind of, it's a very contrived example. But I have here a file called albums.json. It's a JSON a file which has an array. And each element of the array is an object with an artist and an album. And what this script will try to do is for every item, it, it, it so basically tries to count all the number of albums each artist has, and then sort it in descending order. So the yeah, so the artist with the most albums is going to be on top, and then the next one and the next one. So we start with this uh, shebang line. 
So it tells the script to be invoked with the Planck interpreter. Then I require slurp and in. And here I've kind of separated the input parsing section. So getting the input JSON, converting it to closure st structure, and storing it in a variable called input. And the reason is that, well, part of the reason is what I want to do in the output requires the thread last macro. And what I want to do in the input requires the thread first macro. And I've separated those things out. The other option is there's another version of the threading macro called the as threading macro. And I'll show you what it looks like. This is the same file, but using the as threading macro. And what that does is um, it still lets you pipe your data through that pipeline of functions. But now you give it a name. You give it a sort of placeholder symbol. So you say, my input is called d. After I slurp this d argument, whatever that result is, now that's going to be called d. And then after JSON parsing it, whatever I get from that, that's going to be called d. So now I can kind of, whether that d is the first argument of the next function or the last argument or whatever th argument, doesn't matter. You can just put it in the right place, and you still get this pipeline of functions. It has a few more parentheses than the other version, but I think, like potato, potato, it, it has its benefits as well. So here what's happening is you read the standard input, parse it, um, convert it to a closure or data structure, and then to the output, you get all the artists from each element of that array. Um, frequencies is a closure, very neat function that basically takes in, it's built into the st standard library, it takes in a vector, and for every item in that vector, it'll tell you how many times it appears. So it returns your map. So here it says the number one appears once, two appears once, three appears twice, four appears once, and so on. So if you have an array of strings, for instance, it'll tell you cat appears twice, dog appears once. So I'm just piping that list of artists to frequencies, so it counts how many times it appears. And then I'm sorting it by the second element, because in frequencies, the first element is the thing itself. The second element is the number. I'm sorting those numbers in descending order. And then finally, for every item in the output, I just print out the frequency and the name. So all put together, it looks like this. So I can pipe it to sample.cljs. And that gives that. I realized after contriving this example that it's fairly easy to do this with normal shell tools as well. You can basically sort of parse the JSON by hand by cutting on the colons and the, and the double quotes. But yeah, it's, it's more fun to do it in ClojureScript. And, and for the things that I initially tried writing these in ClojureScript, those were quite, quite involved with a lot of group, groupings of things happening and a lot of merging of maps happening, which Clojure was quite useful for. But yeah. Um, that's basically it, I think. I don't have... Yeah, that's all. Any questions? What sort of environment are you using? Uh, the editor is Vim. Um, the terminal is just using Tmux. And Vim has a plugin that like, basically lets it kind of shell out to Tmux and execute stuff in Tmux. So here I can just say... Uh, so I can type it in Vim. And then it'll execute it in the pane below and can zoom the panes and stuff like that. What's the plugin called? It's called Vimux. Vimux. Yeah. Yeah. And for the presentation? The presentation is actually just a closure script file, um, if you see here. And if I zoom it out, you'll see it's just a really long file with a lot of spaces in between. <laughs> so you made it manually? Yeah, I made it pretty manually, and wow. the what I did was, um, if you notice, every slide starts with this comma um, 
followed by the, the title of the slide, <laughs> right? So I have a little function, uh, I have a little mapping here in my VimRC. So basically it um, looks for two line breaks followed by a semicolon and a space, and it jumps to that. <laughs> so it jumps to the top of that. So when I press that key binding, it goes to the next slide. The next slide. Nice. Yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, no, not much is actually happening here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the fonts, I actually found this program while I was looking at something else called Toilet. So if you take a piece of text and send it to this program called Toilet, it'll format it nicely for you and you can pass like, so they have some pre-built fonts and things like that. So that, that's how I got that. Um, toilet and then you can say some, there's some arguments for colors and stuff like that. Yeah. That's about it. Cool. Anything else? All right. Thank you for your time. Um, feel free to ask me later.